Well, we have been looking over the past number of weeks at the compound names of Jehovah in Scripture. We came to the last of those last week, Jehovah Shema. And I said to you on that occasion that that would bring us to the end of our study upon those names. And in one sense, it did. We're not going to be looking at any more compound names of Jehovah. But as I was wrestling through the week as to what I would preach this week, my mind continued to run upon this subject of the names of God. And to one text in particular that I believe that I've mentioned a number of occasions already through this study, and that is Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Our God introduces to us here in the book of Isaiah the Messiah who would come. And as you read our text, there are many titles that are given to him, and the first question that arises is, how many, how many titles do we find in the verse? And as you read it, you'll see that our English version is punctuated in a certain way that suggests that there are five titles here. His name shall be called Wonderful, comma, Counselor, comma, the Mighty God, comma, the Everlasting Father, comma, the Prince of Peace. Five suggested titles. If you were to read it in the Latin Vulgate, the way it's presented there suggests that there are six titles, where it parses the Mighty and then God and separates them into two titles. But the way we're going to look at it this morning is the way I believe that the Hebrew would intend us to look at it, and that is that there are four titles here, whereas the first one, Wonderful Counselor, is one title. You even get that in the rhythm. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Well, of course, this text is found in the book of Isaiah, and Isaiah is writing about 700 years or so before the coming of the Lord Jesus. And his day is one of Assyrian threat. The Assyrians are destroying the northern kingdom. Eventually, they'll come up against Jerusalem and Judea. They will encamp the holy, around the holy city and intend its destruction. And much of what Isaiah says is with direct reference to those immediate circumstances. But he goes beyond that. He goes further to predict what will happen in the captivity of Judah under the Babylonians some 150 years later. He'll take us, of course, way beyond that to what will happen when the Lord Jesus Christ is sent into the world by the Father. And so we have these uh, fulfillments, not only in his immediate context, but also the Babylonian captivity unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And chapter 9 is really unfolding many of these aspects for us. At the beginning of the chapter, we learn of our plight in verse 1. And our plight is darkness and death. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the, sh in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Now it's referring to a region of the land of promise, the northern region around Galilee, uh, the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun. But their condition is described in this way, darkness and death. 
a condition that can be applied to the whole race of men, as we are found naturally in sin before God. Our plight before him is one of darkness and of death. But into that plight we have God's provision. Verse 2, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. The picture is this, children, of darkness giving way to the dawn. So imagine we were sitting here maybe around four o'clock in the morning and everything was dark and we sat there until the sun began to rise and our darkness was turned into light. God says that is going to happen to those people who are suffering this plight of darkness and death. There's going to be a glorious sunrise. And we know from the New Testament that this occurred at the beginning of the ministry of our Lord Jesus. Because in Matthew chapter 4, verse 16, this very text, Isaiah 9, verse 2, is quoted to introduce the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. You remember, he began that ministry in Galilee, in this very region of Naphtali and Zebulun. And the ministry of Christ was like sunrise breaking forth into their darkness and death. So verse 2, the light is arising upon a darkened people. How does it arise? Well, verse 6 links it not just to the beginning of Jesus' ministry, but of Jesus' coming into the world. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. God has provided light life and salvation through the unspeakable gift of his son, our Lord Jesus. Well, then we have Messiah's power. Messiah's power. The government is upon his shoulder. We saw in our reading how later in the chapter we're told that the problem in Israel was the leaders of this people caused them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. So, so much of what is wrong in Israel has to do with ungodly leadership. But here's a child, here's a son, who's going to come into the world, and the government is going to be upon his shoulders. He will have the authority, and his kingdom will advance under his government and reign. Verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Our plight, God's provision, Messiah's power. But what is his name? Well, the Lord says to us, his name is this, Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Brethren, as that name is declared unto you this morning, it is like sunrise that is sent into our hearts to dispel the darkness. It's the joy of salvation that is sent into our soul to dispel all of our misery. Verse 3 refers to that, that when he comes, it's going to be like the joy of harvest and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. The harvest has come, the victory is won, and God's people are rejoicing in that triumph and in God's provision. May the Lord give us ears to hear this morning as he opens up this glorious name to us and sends forth his light into our hearts. Well, what's the first thing here? Christ is our wonderful counselor. Christ is our wonderful counselor. You know that the Bible ascribes to God many marvelous things. He performs miracles, signs, and wonders. He created the heavens and the earth. He delivered his people out of the bondage of Egyptian captivity. But here in Isaiah chapter 9 is another wonder, indeed the supreme work and wonder of God. 
as he sends forth his son into the world and rightly gives him this name. Wonderful counselor. Well, you see that word wonderful, it is found only in one other place in the Bible with reference to a person. And if you turn in your Bible, you'll find it in the book of Judges, chapter 13. Judges chapter 13, Israel are under oppression at the hand of the Philistines and God is going to cause light to arise into their darkness through the birth of a deliverer by the name of Samson. And Samson's parents-to-be, Manoah and his wife, have an encounter with the angel of the Lord. We noted a few weeks ago that the angel of the Lord in the, the Old Testament is a manifestation of the Lord himself. In Judges chapter 13, verse 17, we read, And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name, that when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor? And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? That's our word from Isaiah 9, verse 6. Secret in the sense that it is wonderful. It's a mystery. It's something that is incomprehensible to us. Not something that has been hidden from us. That's not what God does when he declares his names. Sometimes we do that with names. Sometimes men, they give themselves many names and the purpose of that is so that they might conceal their identity. They take on aliases so that you don't know who they are. But when God gives himself names, it's not to conceal, it's to reveal. But his name is so wonderful, so mysterious, so glorious, so incomprehensible that the angel of the Lord says, why is it that you declare after my name, seeing that it is secret? There's a sense in which though God reveals it to us, we will never fully comprehend it. And light is now coming into the world to dispel our darkness. And it's coming through Messiah. And God says, his name is wonderful. Wonderful. The incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest wonder of God than the world has, that the world has ever known. And every which way you think of Christ, he's wonderful. You can study his person, that he is God of God the eternal Son of the Father, and that is wonderful. And you can consider his natures as he comes into the world and assumes ours and unites God and man together in two natures and one person. And you say, that is wonderful, incomprehensible. And then you study his history from his birth to the end of his life and everything that life was filled with, his words, his works, his sufferings. Go with him into the garden of Gethsemane and see him wrestling to the point that he sweats blood and you say, that is wonderful. And then you go to the cross and see the God-man shed his blood and bear the wrath of his Father so that he will redeem worthless sinners unto himself. And it's wonderful. Do you watch him rise from the dead, ascend to the Father, and know hidden from our view, yet more real than anything else in life, he is reigning at the right hand of God, exalted far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. Why? Because his name is wonderful. But in our text, he's wonderful counselor. Wonderful counselor. We're a culture that is very interested in counselors. 
you go into industry and there are counselors everywhere. People make a living from being consultants and advisors. They, co they counsel groups in industry to be more efficient, productive in their work. You go into clinics and you've got another brand of counselor who's trying to help those who have mental health issues, emotional problems. You go into schools. They didn't used to have them, but they have them now. You have counselors. And yes, you come into church and every church has at least one counselor if they have a pastor. Much of the work of pastoral ministry is just that, counseling the people of God. We have counselors because we all need direction. And we go to them so that we might learn a better way of doing things. And we have counselors not just because we need direction, but because we're struggling and broken and we need comfort and repair. Now, some of those counselors are awful, they're, they're charlatans. You go to them with a problem and they make you feel good. They tell you wonderful things about yourself that very often aren't even true. They're more like life coaches or life gurus. Then you go to other counselors and they're, they're good. And they've helped a lot of people. They have empathy. They have wisdom. They have discernment. People who are able to take the Word of God and open up your condition and show how the Word of God applies to that condition. Some are awful, some are good, but one is wonderful. One is wonderful. And that one is our Lord Jesus Christ. The best counselor that you've ever gone to is a limited man seeking to help another limited person. He's a broken man who's seeking to help another broken man. But in this wonderful counselor are hid all of the treasures of wisdom and of knowledge. how we should learn from that this morning. There's a wonderful word of counsel here for our instruction. Our Lord Jesus is wonderful counselor. That means when you go to Christ, that you can be confident that he will tell you exactly what you need. He's not the charlatan counselor who's going to take your money and just try to make you feel good about yourself. Just try to paint over all the cracks of your problem. He's going to tell you exactly what the problem is and exactly what you need. Think about how he does this in Scripture with sinners. We referenced it a few weeks ago, Isaiah chapter 1. He says to this filthy, polluted, corrupt, broken people, filthy from the top of their head to the sole of their foot, he says, sit down. I want to counsel you. Come and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Your problem is this. You're filthy. But there's a solution to your problem. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they be as, they'll be as wool. Do you see how he does it? Come and let us reason together now, saith the Lord. Isaiah goes on to tell us that the Lord has given him the spirit of wisdom, that the Lord has given him the tongue of the learned so that he knows how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. That he won't break the broken reed. He won't quench the smoking flax. He comes to the church in the book of Revelation and they had false views of themselves. Church of Laodicea. They said, we are rich and increased in goods and we have need of nothing. And Jesus comes and says, oh, how wrong you are. You've no idea that you're wretched and poor and miserable and blind and naked. But he doesn't stop there. He says, I counsel you. I counsel you to buy off me gold tried in the fire that you might be rich. That you would come to me, that I would anoint your eyes with eye salves so that you might see. Do you see what he's doing? 
He says, here's your problem, but I am the solution to every one of your problems. You're filthy, I'll cleanse you. You're naked, I'll clothe you. You're blind, I'll give you sight. You're poor, I'll enrich you. That's the counsel that comes to you and me this morning from our wonderful counsel, counselor, the Lord Jesus Christ. But then he counsels us so as to comfort us. He guides us with his counsel. Afterwards, he receives us unto glory. And when we go to him with all of our brokenness and our problems... We cast our cares upon him knowing that he is able to care for us. Now, some of you have received wonderful help from other men. We bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. But nobody else in this world is able to catch and carry your cares the way this wonderful counselor is. Receive it by faith this morning. Jesus Christ is our wonderful counselor. Secondly, Jesus Christ is our mighty God. And now there's a lot of debate over this text and what the titles actually mean. And there are many liberal theologians who don't believe that Jesus Christ is God and when they come to this verse, they note that this word God is used in various ways in Scripture of angels and, and also of men, of rulers. And thus there is no reason to believe, they say, that this is really referring to the divine nature of Christ at all. When he is given the name, the mighty God. Well, we have to agree with them that the word Elohim, meaning God, which is a plural word, is used in Scripture to refer to angels, to false gods, and to men, those who are rulers in church and in state. However, this word is not Elohim. It's simply the word El. And that word El is never referred to anyone other than God in the Old Testament Scriptures, and especially in the book of Isaiah. And so you find this again in the next chapter, or sorry, chapter 10, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 20 and verse 21. The same title, and it's clearly a reference to God. Isaiah 10, verse 20, And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. So it's clear there who we're talking about. Jehovah, the Holy One of Israel. Verse 21, The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. Well, there's our title. El Gibor, the mighty God. And that same title is found in the previous chapter, chapter 9, verse 6, and applied to this child who would be born, who will be the light of the world, shining into our darkness. Messiah is therefore more than a man. Messiah is the mighty God, El Gibor. Well, what does this title bring to our mind? First of all, it sets before our mind the image of a warrior king. A warrior king. That word gibor, it's used throughout the Old Testament to refer to those who are mighty men of valor. You could read in 2 Samuel chapter 23 the list of all those men that fought in David's army, Shammah, Benaiah, Eleazar, Uriah the Hittite, and they're all the Giborim, the mighty men, those who were recognized in the army of David as being proficient warriors. And the Lord takes this term that was recognized in Old Testament culture as referring to these mighty men, and he appends it to his own name. 
and he says, Messiah is going to be El Gibor. He's going to be the mighty God. Elsewhere, we find Jesus referred to as a man of war, a mighty conqueror who will engage and prevail against all of his enemies. And so when we come to this text, a child is born, a son is given, it all looks so quiet, and yet when he's given this title, he appears to be an invincible warrior king. Well, friends, I say to you this morning, that's your savior. He is El Gibor. He is the mighty God. And as such, he has done at least four things. And the first is this, he has conquered sin by death. The mighty God ha has conquered sin by death. That was our plight, wasn't it? Verse 2, we're sitting in darkness, we're dwelling in the land of the shadow of death. Death that hovers over you and me because sin has entered into the world and death through sin and into our predicament steps God's provision, El Gibor, the mighty, the mighty God. And what does he do? He takes away our curse by taking on that great enemy of death. We read of it in Hebrews chapter 2. He takes bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. <coughs> in order that he might die and deliver those who for fear of death were all of their lifetime subject to its bondage. The church father Athanasius said that the eternal son took our body, that in our body he might find death and blot it out. And so he did. Our mighty warrior king. He put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Literally, he disarmed sin. He abolished sin. He canceled sin by the sacrifice of himself. Our mighty God conquered sin by death, but then our mighty God conquered death by the resurrection. He conquered sin by death, and then he conquers death by the resurrection. Our catechism reminds us that he continued after his death under the power of that death, but for a time. And on the third day, he rose again, according to the scriptures. Children, the resurrection was many things. It was God's answer to men that he had accepted the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's our assurance that if we have Christ, he is the resurrection and the life, and if we believe in him, we have that life and will never die. It's all those things. But at the basic and fundamental level, do you know what the resurrection is? It's Jesus kicking in the gates of death and saying, you will not hold me anymore. You have no power here because I conquered sin by death and now I conquered death in the resurrection. And as he, ri as, as he rises triumphantly from the dead, everyone that believes in him rises triumphantly in him. Christ is your mighty God this morning. But then he conquers Satan. He conquers Satan. You remember how the Bible pictures this? Satan has a, a great strong house, like a fortified castle. And Jesus invades the strong man's house. And then he binds the strong man. And then he spoils all of his goods. Well, you see Christ doing that, don't you? The beginning of his ministry, he's anointed by the Spirit. Immediately, he's taken out into the wilderness where he is tempted of the devil for 40 days. He enters into spiritual combat with the devil. And every attack Satan makes, Jesus repels. 
He continues his ministry and Satan's emissaries attack him at every point. Demons here, demons there. Men stirred up by de the devil because of envy and hatred and every encounter Jesus triumphs. And then we get to the cross. And at the cross, Jesus strikes the death blow to the serpent. You know, you wonder about the psychology of all that. Satan is so addicted to the destruction of Jesus Christ that he can't see that everything he does to destroy Christ actually furthers the mission of Christ. And at the trial and crucifixion, and as Jesus hangs upon the cross, it's, it's almost like the serpent opens his mouth wide and is going to sink his fangs into the Son of God. And every nail that is hammered into the body of Jesus and every cry that is drawn out of the soul of the God-man is Christ stamping upon the head of the serpent until he finally crushes his head. That's your mighty God. And then our mighty God rescues sinners from bondage. Those who are under the power of the devil, he's bound the strong man, he's invaded his house, he releases his captives. He says unto sinners like you and me who have no power of ourselves to be saved, let my people go. Let my people go that they may serve me. And he translates us from the kingdom of darkness and he brings us into the kingdom of God's dear Son and he gives us the liberty of the sons of God. Do you see your mighty God this morning? Do you, do you, do you see how wonderful, how wonderful is the name of our Christ? He conquers sin by death and death by the resurrection. He crushes the head of the serpent. He rescues sinners from bondage. And then at last, he will destroy every one of his enemies. He saves his people perfectly. And he destroys his enemies eternally. You've already sung of that this morning in Psalm 50. The mighty God. Did you note it? The mighty God. El Gibor. The mighty God the Lord hath spoken and did call the earth from rising of the sun to where he has its fall. From out of Zion Hill, which of excellency, the beauty and perfection is God shine. There he is in his light. God shine gloriously. Our God shall surely come. Keep silence shall not he. Before him fire shall waste. Great storms shall round about him be. What's he coming to do? He's coming to judge the world in righteousness. But then he says, Together let my saints unto me gathered be, those that by sacrifice have made a covenant with me. He died for them on the cross. He called them to himself in time. He kept them by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And now he receives them unto himself and all those who did not obey the calls of El Gibor, our mighty God. He will destroy in everlasting judgment forever. Christ is our wonderful counselor. Christ is our mighty God. Thirdly, Christ is our everlasting Father. Christ is our everlasting Father. Further proof of Messiah's deity. It's a divine title. But when you hear it, you wonder, how does it apply to Jesus? Children, if I were to ask you today... Is Jesus the Father or the Son or the Spirit? I'm quite confident that you would tell me Jesus is the Son. So how is it that Messiah the Son is given the name 
the everlasting Father? <coughs> well, I think we first have to say that he is the Son in the eternal trinity, and the Son is not the Father, nor is the Father the Son with respect to divine persons. But the Word of God also tells us that the Son is, in certain senses, a Father. The first sense would be in respect to creation, that he has given birth, he has given being to all things. John chapter 1, that there was nothing made in this world that was not made by and for Jesus Christ. So to put it simply, he's the father of everything in that everything owes its existence to the Son of God. You owe your existence to the Son of God. But of course, this is not speaking here of creation. This is speaking of redemption. But we find again that there is a sense in which Jesus is the everlasting father of his people by redemption. Think of how that's presented to us, especially in uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 2. Why did Jesus come into the world? We're told that Jesus came into the world so that he might bring many sons to glory. Well, that's the relationship of parent to child, isn't it? Father to son. Jesus comes into the world that he might bring many sons to glory. And then if you go back into eternity and understand that eternal covenant of redemption, the Father gives a people unto the Son. Now there, Jesus is evidently the Son. He's the eternal Son. But when the Father gives a people to, his, to the Son, what does he call that people? He calls that people his seed. Oh, well, there's the idea again. The seed of Christ, therefore being the children of Christ. If you turn to Isaiah or Hebrews chapter 2 and look there at verse 13, you'll see that Jesus is here uh, referring to his people as children. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 13. This is actually a quote from Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 18. But Hebrews chapter 2 verse 13. And again I will put my trust in him, and again behold I and the children which God hath given me. Jesus, the Messiah, is children. Well, that chapter tells us that he took not on himself the nature of angels. He took upon himself the seed of Abraham, that he might be made like unto us in all things. He's not ashamed to call us brethren. The book of Isaiah goes further. It opens up the sufferings of Christ to us. He comes as the Lamb of God, the suffering servant. And when you come to Isaiah 53, verse 10, when Jesus has borne our guilt, he's poured out his soul unto death, we're told this, he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. He shall see his seed. It's there again. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Well, back to our text, Jesus, I hope you see, is therefore rightly named the everlasting Father. He has a seed and he redeems that seed. And in time, he brings them to the birth. He, 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 he sends the Spirit so that they might be born again into the kingdom. And every single individual who was born into that kingdom is the fruit of Christ's suffering, and Jesus wonderfully sees his seed. When you came to Christ, Jesus saw his seed, another one of his children born of the Spirit. And even more wonderful than that, he saw his seed, and he was satisfied. Imagine that. He went through the whole of his life of suffering and contradiction. He bore the wrath of God. And he sees you and me born again of the Spirit. And he's satisfied in that he sees his children coming to him. 
Christ is therefore the everlasting Father, and in a sense he is your Father, the Father of his people. Now there are good fathers in the world, and if you have a good father, that is a tremendous blessing. But no matter how good your father is, Jesus excels him by far. He is wiser than your father to guide you. He is wealthier than your father to provide for you. He is stronger than your father to protect you. He is more balanced than your father to make the right decisions and to guide you. But maybe you're sitting saying, well, I don't really have a very good father. I don't know what it was to have a good father. Well, you've had a bad father. Well, that's something we sympathize with. But it only accentuates the contrast. Because God comes to you in his son and he offers you the perfect father. Sometimes parents are void of natural affection. They abuse their children. They abandon their children. They lie. They steal from their children. But the word of God tells us that though a woman may And it's very unlikely, but though she may forget her sucking child, yet I will not forget you because you are graven upon the palms of my hands. Children, you've seen people with tattoos, haven't you? Maybe they got them recently. Maybe they got them years ago and wish they didn't have them anymore. But there's the tattoo still. God is saying to you, I have permanently inked you. I have engraved you. I have scarred you on the palms of my hands. It is impossible that I will forget you. Jesus will never abuse his children. Jesus will never leave or forsake his children. Christ has no orphans in his family. And as such, he comes to us in the gospel and he says, I am your everlasting father. What a word to sinners. You know, every one of us by nature has the worst father imaginable. We are of our father, the devil, and he abuses us and he lies to us. We can never please him. No matter what he does, no matter what we do, he beats us for it. We have the worst spiritual father imaginable. And God comes to us and says, in Christ, I will give you the best father imaginable and all of his everlasting paternal care. Who wouldn't want that? You speak to any person who's been abused by their father and it affects them deeply, lastingly, They're broken all of their childhood. They wanted his care and his affection and they never got it. And Satan is worse than that. Doesn't matter how bad your father was to you. I tell you, Satan is worse than that to your soul. And you know the longing in your heart to have had a better father than that but oh, the longing we ought to have in our hearts for this father. When he comes to us in the gospel and says, I'll bring light into your darkness, I'll bring joy into your misery, I'll never abuse you, abandon you, leave you, or forsake you. What a word to sinners. And what a comfort to saints. When you think of the father that you had, and now you know the father that you have. You know, these things that I speak to you of this morning are true, that Jesus meant what he said when he said, I will not leave you orphans. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Though your father and your mother leave you as they do, and we all end up orphans at last, yet the Lord will, will take you up. He takes you up forever. Christ is our wonderful counselor. Christ is our mighty God. Christ is our everlasting father. And Christ, fourthly, is 
our Prince of Peace. The Bible tells us that he is the Prince of the kings of the earth, but it also shows us that he is not like them. Because those princes build their kingdoms by force, by intrigue, by politics, by economics. But Christ, the Prince of Peace, rules over a kingdom of peace, which has peace for its foundation, peace for its walls, and peace for all of its inhabitants. How do we know that Christ is the Prince of Peace? Where do we see it? Well, surely, first of all, we see it in its foundation. That the foundation of this peace is laid in his satisfaction. So we go back to the cross and we ask, what is, what's Christ doing there? Well, he's redeeming us to God, but at the heart of that is he's paying our debt and he's taking away the enmity that is between God and sinners. The sword of God's wrath directed at you because of your guilt, Christ takes the sword. The sword sheathed in the heart of the Savior so that the Father is satisfied. And he receives all sinners, though they were enemies, when they come unto God through him. So there's the foundation of that peace. And it's sure, it's an everlasting foundation. Jesus has made satisfaction and reconciled sinners to God. But then the second way we see this peace is that not only does the Prince of Peace lay the foundation, but the Prince of Peace begins to build this kingdom by proclamation. First his satisfaction, then his proclamation. He dies and he rises again, and then he commissions his emissaries, his peacemakers, to go into all the world and to tell sinners what Jesus has done. Go tell them that I died. Go tell them that, that I paid the price. Go tell them that I risen again from the dead. And brethren, as those preachers go forth into the world with this message, God says it's like this, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace that bringeth good tidings of good things, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. It's always good for us to remember that what God is doing is not in the abstract by way of theory. He's actually doing it right now in the concrete as the word of God is preached to you. The beautiful feet of an ambassador of the king who's publishing peace Peace, peace to sinners on the behalf of God. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10, 9 and 10 tells us that he's going to speak peace to the heathen. Well, I say again, understand God's preaching peace to you. He's saying Jesus has led the foundation, Jesus is building his kingdom. And he builds his kingdom by offering terms to his enemies. But then we see that not only is he the Prince of Peace in his satisfaction and in his proclamation, but he is the Prince of Peace to you in, in your reception. Your reception of the offer. When you hear the gospel preached, how are you to respond? Well, you know that you're to believe. You know that you're to repent. Let me give it to you in an image. When the gospel is preached to you, you are to lay down your weapons. You are to cease from your hostility you're to wave the white flag of surrender and you're to take Jesus Christ upon his terms and not yours. Now, they're not hard terms. 
They're the best terms of surrender that you would ever hear in the history of warfare. Because they come to you from one who is ever willing to receive sinners. One who is ever ready to forgive sinners. One who delights in mercy and freely offers himself and salvation so as to bless his enemies, not to abuse them. And yet the hearts of sinners are so blind and hard that they refuse the terms of Christ's offer of peace. Will you accept them this morning? Christ is preaching peace to you. Christ is offering his terms to you. And all you have to do is to step down from your pride, lay down your weapons, and accept him. Well, that's true upon our believing, isn't it? And then from that point, all throughout our life, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness and it's peace and it's joy in the Holy Ghost. Is this name not wonderful to your soul this morning? Is this name not, as the Song of Solomon describes it, ointment or, or perfume poured forth as if God smashed a bottle of the most fragrant perfume in our midst this morning and said, breathe it in. You've never savored the like of it before. So it is in Jesus that he holds forth light and life and joy and salvation in him. What is his name? wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Let's stand for prayer.